Good morning, Ben. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, morning, Haley. Haley. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Uh, Haley. Good morning, Brian. (laughs) Uh, Haley, as you may recall, Mark's been with us once before. Uh, And just to remind people, uh, in my estimation, Mark is, is the father of sexuality education in film. He, he has been in the field for years and years, helping others understand human sexuality through film. Um, and he recently not, had a, a film on gender, um, which is really where I hope we can spend some time today. Mark has a website called uh, Sex Smart Films and uh, dot com. And he has thousands of films on all different aspects of human sexuality that you can rent for 99 cents or pay a yearly fee and have access to them in an unlimited way. Amazing. Sure. And Mark, are those Oscars behind you? No. Oh, no, those are telly awards. Okay. <laughs> I know we're just in Oscar season or we yes. just had Oscar no. season. The, those are telly awards. Gotcha. So I think for me, at least, a good place to start always is defining the context of sexuality that we're going to be having this conversation in. So, Mark, could you give us that context of when you're speaking of sexuality, what are you talking about? Well, I look at sexuality from three aspects, from education, from research, and from therapy. And the way, if you had told me when I was in undergraduate school that I would be making films about sexuality, I probably would have told you, you were out of your mind. (laughs) Photography was a hobby and I was teaching health education in New York. And they mandated that we teach about sexually transmitted infections. And I started teaching that in the first day of class, when I talked about sexual contact, students were saying, what do you mean by that? And I'd said either sexual intercourse or oral genital contact. Now, these students were 12 years old and they wanted to know what I meant by that. So I spent the whole first class talking about what I meant by sexual contact The period ends, which was a 45 minute class. I walked out of the room and the principal of the school is waiting there. He knew it was the first day of class. And he said, how did it go? And I said, if I were a parent, I would not be happy. He said, why? I said, I'm teaching their children about sexuality by way of disease. Can you think of a more negative approach? And he said, well, what should we do about it? And I said, let's start a sex education program. And that's how it started. And go. I was going to say, in my all boys Catholic high school, Christian Brothers of Ireland, they showed us one film in all of our time, and it was on gonorrhea. Yeah, and that was very common that the only time you wanted to talk about sex was about disease. In fact, Mm -hmm. we call it the disease model. And after, you know, I didn't know anything about sex education. So I started doing some research and I saw that New York University had a program in human sexuality, a graduate program. And that summer I would be able to go to Sweden and take 12 graduate credits in human sexuality. So I did that. And I remember the first day I'm in this little town called Uppsala, which is a university town in Sweden. And the first day I figured I'll take a walk. And I'm walking and I see a vending machine that looks exactly like the vending machine on the New York City subways where I grew up and where you could buy a stick of gum for a coin. So I figure I'm gonna have myself a piece of gum. I walked up to the vending machine It wasn't a gum machine. It was a condom machine in the middle of the street in this little town. And I I went, whoa, this is different. And so the cultural differences 
were amazing. They had sex education on a national level that where we have math, history, and science, they have those, but they also have sexuality. And I observed classes of five-year-olds. They learned accurate names for genitals. I did a program for undergraduate students this year, and I asked them to write down the names they used for genitals when they were a child. If there were 100 students in the group, Two used penis and vulva. The most common were private parts. And if you look at the research and say, compare United States and Sweden, you see the onset of sexual behavior, same. Of course, there are people who say, oh, you teach them about sexuality, they'll become sexually active earlier. No. What is different if you compare teenage pregnancies, United States and Sweden, United States is much higher. If you look at HIV, United States and Sweden, United States is much higher during teenage years. Same with syphilis and gonorrhea. So they learn to be responsible about their sexual behavior. And unfortunately, we don't. And if you look at the research and see where do most Americans get their first sex information, they don't get it from their parents, they don't get it in schools, they go on the internet and they end up on an adult film site. So the average American sees adult films on the internet by the time they're 10 or 11. And that is not the way in my opinion, we want to introduce our children to sexuality education. Those films are not made to educate. So. I mean, just to clarify, so we're talking today about sexu sex uh, sexuality in terms of genitalia and the act of having sex. And I think to your point, Mark, you know, I agree with you because my first introduction to sex and my first sex talk was it's dangerous, you're going to get hurt. And if you're not careful, you're going to get diseases and you could die because that's when AIDS was starting to come out. So sex has always been a very scary thing for me. Yes. Um, and sort of as I've grown up with it and sort of branched into what I've been afraid of, I, you know, porn became a very sort of interesting topic for me and it scared the bejesus out of me back in, I want to say it was 2010 or 2000, 2010, 2012, where like porn addiction in children was an actual thing where children were seeing therapists because of their addiction to porn. And I was just like, oh my God, where are we going with this? And I think, you know, that was my first sort of slap in the face of this is what sex is today um well back then but even now looking at today when you look at sites like OnlyFans and the accessibility of pornography and the number of men that their first introduction to sex is porn and the number of women that believe that that is the way to value themselves is to show themselves in that way it's incredibly difficult to navigate a healthy relationship today Yes. And, and what you just said, Haley, is so true. And I've experienced this. I'll give you an example. I worked for a, comp a marketing company that we did the Better Sex video series, which was advertised in every magazine you can imagine. And I was producing these films. And they had real couples, and they were in instructional. They were not made to titillate. And there was one couple, a married couple, and we were about to shoot the sex scene. And the, the male said, can I ask you a question? And there's a big crew. And I said, sure. And he didn't want to ask it out loud. So I pulled him aside and he whispered, where should I come? And I thought, where did he learn about sexuality? So I said to him, when you and your wife make love at home, where do you come? And he looked a little embarrassed. He said, 
I just come inside her. And I said, well, we are looking for sexual realism. I want you to do just what you do at home. So the negative aspect of this is it's just a carryover, you know, that young people look at pornographic films and think that's their role model for sexual behavior. It's, it's scary too, you know, I've noticed just in sort of the last year, single available men are either into OnlyFans or some kind of porn, they're into BDSM, or they into the shibari, which is the rope tying and that kind of stuff. So sex is very much associated with some kind of domination, some kind of pain. And But if that domination and pain is mutually consensual, it's okay. The, the thing that I think we see is that often people do that without consent. And there are- No, carry on. I, I was gonna say there are couples who this is a part of their relationship. They enjoy, you know, bond. Is that a healthy psyche though? If we're looking at sort of the world that we're trying to create, is it healthy? Is it whole? Is it complete? That if, humans associate sex with pain? Well, it's not real pain. It, it's fantasy. And, uh, you know, I've talked to people who, couples who are, this is part, I mean, in real life, you know, when they're together in the living room, they're watching a movie and eating dinner and just being affectionate. But they do different things in the bedroom. And, you know, you can't, is what I've learned is there's, I remember when I was young and just got out of graduate school, I thought I knew everything there was to know about sexuality. But the longer I live, it's like I hear more and different things. And the, the big issue, and this is an important part of sexuality education, is consent and learning about being consensual. Can I expand the conversation a little bit? In your definition of sexuality, Mark, you focused on genitalia and intercourse. Uh, uh, sexuality, human sexuality, as we both agree, is also about our sense of self as a sexual person. And um, if it's okay, I, I want to segue into uh, all of the controversy today over transgender children not being allowed in 20 states to uh, uh, express their gender identity in school. They're, they're not allowed to compete on, uh, in athletics. They're not allowed to use a restroom that matches their gender. And they're not, they're, the teachers are not allowed to refer to them by their chose, the name they've chosen or the gender they've chosen. How, how is that going to impact those children? I think it's going to impact them in a very negative way. And I think it's dangerous. I think it's disrespectful. And when you think we're in 2023, in 1966, Dr. Harry Benjamin wrote the book. Who, Dr. Benjamin was an endocrinologist and he wrote the book, The Transsexual Phenomenon. And he recognized that this was a condition that you don't choose it. You're born this way. It's a biological condition. And he recognized this. He, he collaborated on some projects with Alfred Kinsey. Kinsey would refer, when Kinsey did his interviews, he would refer people who did not identify as their biological sex to Dr. Benjamin. Dr. Benjamin in the 60s was helping young people and older people transition. And it, it's something that is beyond me that this is still going on in 2023. Look at the science. 
you know, I did a film called Trans that came out in 2012, and it's still on Amazon Prime. And I remember one of the trans people in the film was about 45, 50, and we were doing a screening at the University of Michigan. And after the film, we had a Q&A, and she was up there with me, and a young undergraduate student got up and said to her, why did you choose to be this way? And may I quote her exact response? Who the fuck would choose this? Mm. And it just, you know, I think of Oscar Wilde and his famous saying, you have to be yourself because everyone else is taken. And we need to let our young people do that. The suicide rate in the transgender community, there's a st- was a study done with 6,000 transgender people online. And one question was, did you ever seriously contemplate or attempt suicide? 41% said yes. In the general population, it's less than 2%. So we, ah, I get, we really need to fix this. And the politicians who are pushing this need to look at the science and need to look at the damage they are doing. Thank you. Uh, Haley, will you weigh in? It's not a topic you and I have talked about. And I'm real interested in, um, Mark, when Haley and I first started doing these podcasts, uh, she she told me she felt that LGBTQ people had a superpower and that coming out um, as whatever uh, was was the hero's journey. Haley, do you see that in the struggle that these kids uh, have right now? I think it's incredibly difficult to navigate this path because I'm not going to allow the media to be my context. So I have to look very carefully at what is my personal experience with transgender. My personal experience with transgender are adults that made the choice as an adult, as what we consider an 18 year old, then made the choice, not necessarily the choice, but made the transition into being who they felt was their true self. My experience with children under the age of 18, or, you know, even teens and below, being able to identify as something different, I don't have a lot of experience with that. Um, so I can't speak to it. Um, I think that the tra- my personal opinion on the trans- transgender issue and the politics of it is very much a conscious collective of where we all are. And I think for me, the root of the problem is that we have people that have never sat and looked at themselves in the mirror trying to tell other people how they should be and how they should live their life. And I think as long as we have that cycle perpetuating, we're gonna continue to see these kinds of injustices. I think the sooner that adults take the responsibility and the accountability of their words, of their actions, slow down, then we can teach younger generations about themselves and about the journey of exploring yourself and coming into yourself. Haley, that, I bet that's for me a great answer. Uh, and I'm while you were talking about it, I feel that it's both sides that need to sit down and take a look at themselves. It, you know, as a as a a gay man who's been doing sex education for nearly fifty years. I understand heterosexual audiences, you know, and and understand that there are people who are there who have never been given the opportunity to learn something about sexuality. And I feel that we on the progressive side have gone too fast. It's an issue that's immediate in the lives of people, 
But when you have people like um, Governor DeSantis talking about woke, W-O-K-E, and in his mind, that's talking about political correctness. And, and there's a following for that. There are a lot of people who feel that we, we keep throwing new things at them, expecting that they're going to get it, that they're going to understand, you know, having a, a, a transgender child compete against my daughter and, you know, high school track. They're confused. They don't, you know, that doesn't make sense to them. Uh, so both sides have to breathe mm -hmm. and and say, you know, I'm really sorry for going so fast on this because we, you know, we since I started off, you know, it was the gay movement, then it was the gay and lesbian movement, then it was gay, lesbian, bisexual movement. We never bothered to explain bisexuality. Then it was the BLGT, the the transgender, and under that T there was dozens of different definitions and then an i came along and an a came along and another q came along and and the general public who's not had a chance to understand what this means laughs at it they laugh at the absurdity of it and they say enough is enough and so we have to i believe patiently educate people instead of saying that they're they're all uh, social conservative. We have to take the uh, give the opportunity to them to understand, you know, what we're talking about, and acknowledge to them that we've grown really fast on this. Mm -hmm. What do you so, think about? That? Well, I the only thing I disagree with is fast. I think we're going really slow. You know, you look at, and I like to take a historical perspective. You look at sexual orientation. Magnus Hirschfeld, who was a German Jewish physician in Germany in the 1930s, started the first sex sexological organization in the world. He had an institute, he had a library. When the Nazis took over Germany, they destroyed the building that the institute was in and they burned every book. And here he was openly gay in the 1930s. And his, fortunately, he was not in Germany when the Institute was burnt down. He was on a speaking tour outside of the country. But we look at him and what he taught. And you ask anyone today, and very few people have even heard of him. The same with Harry Benjamin, same with Alfred Kinsey. And I think we need to look at some of the science. If we looked at the science, we would say, oh, yeah, this is this is what the way it is. You know, and, and there are people who go their whole lives without coming out. And the story that Dr. Christine McGinn, who's the surgeon in my documentary Trans, told me a story about an 85-year-old man biological man who came to her and said, I want a vaginoplasty. He wanted to transform from a male to a female. And she said, you're 85. And he said, she said, I've always known I was transgender from the time I was a child. When I was very young, I married so-and-so and I loved her very much. And I, we had two children, and I would never do anything to hurt her. She passed away last year, and I want to die my authentic self. Mm -hmm. Dr. McGinn did the surgery on this 85-year-old person. And I think this, for it, I mean, if we heard this story, how many people are out there who are gay, transgender, non-binary, whatever, and have never revealed it and have not lived their authentic selves? To me, that is a crime that our society is not letting people be themselves. 
I'm, I don't disagree, but I think what I'm not comparing the U.S. to another country and the advances that they've made. Just my feeling is that the U.S. culture, you know, our culture, we need to take a look at it and acknowledge what's this great divide about? Why are we so divided on, on, on issues all over the place, including trans kids? We're but not going to get it. We're not going to get anywhere by yelling at people. Yeah. The but, only way that we're going to help them move forward is by telling stories like you just did, Mark. And, and this goes beyond what we're talking about. I mean, you think of race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity. These are all things that are stigmatized. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Is there, you know, when you look at the science, the education, you know, people don't choose their skin color. People don't choose their ethnicity, their sexual orientation, their gender. They're born this way. So I have a hard time understanding this. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, on the more positive side, I think it's a wonderful time and space that this is all now being spoken about and we're getting to see how people are easily triggered and something that a word that you've mentioned a lot um, mark is science and if we would just look at the science and that resonates with me because a lot of the work i do which is energetic science completely backs it up and science has backed it up since science was invented um and one of sort of the bigger things that rile me is that it only becomes science when a white dude gives it a name and I find it interesting that we use, we the collective are happy to refer to science when it's comfortable and it fits our belief system. When it aggravates or conflicts with what we believe, then it's no longer about the science. Mm -hmm. So I think I wanted to ask the two of you, you know, sort of moving forward and hopefully people you know, I think needing to listen is a big part of this. But how do we start bringing science into the conversation and gently steering people to accept science? Well, I would say we start have to use education to teach the history. You know, this is not something that was brought up in 2023. This is something that's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. And you know, before people recognized the science, and when you think about people who were stigmatized, it's not, you know, because something is uh, bad, it's because some people, they're different, and people are not comfortable with difference. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. I, you know, I've, I've been really lucky in my life um, from kin kindergarten on. You know, in my class, there was a, a black child, a dwarf. Uh, uh, I, my best friend was Jewish. And so I didn't see any difference you know, I, I thought we're all part of the gang, you know, we're our gang. And and that really helped me when it started coming up in my life later. When I met people, I'd say, oh, yeah, you know, that's like Joey. That's, you know, that's like Alan. And, yes. and so uh, and a lot of people haven't had the benefit. And mine was just luck uh, to have been exposed to people who were different than they were. The other part of that is you never learned hate. Hate is something you learn. You're not born hating. Mm -hmm. And I, I think about when the Black Lives Matter started about three years ago. I have a grandson who's nine. So three years ago, he was six. And he and his friends play in an alley behind the houses. And when he heard about Black Lives Matter, he came up to me one day and he says, 
grandpa, you know Jordan and Camante? And I'm thinking, yeah, he's been playing with them for years. He said, they're black. <laughs> <laughs> so the first time he recognized that yeah, they were... He, yeah. He didn't notice they had a different color. They were just kids. And I thought, wow. I think there was some research. And I say I think because I can't specifically remember the research around this. But I do remember there being research that the problem, the problem with trance and difference is infused from the adults. Most of the kids at the school don't care. Mm -hmm. It's the parents that start caring and the parents that start sort of, you know, understandably coming from a place of love, albeit perhaps a little bit convoluted, that yeah. sort of rile up and start this conversation and then turn it into something much different than what it perhaps should be. And so we're talking about education here. It seems like, and obviously this is a massive sort of huge scene because I'm not in education and sex education. It's not so much that we need to educate the kids. We need to educate the adults. You are so, you nailed it. And I could give you one example. I did a screening of trans here in Washington, DC. And after the screening, a couple comes up to me with a seven-year-old little girl wearing a dress and said, hi, we enjoyed the film. This is Eliana. She's in Oscar's class. Oscar is my grandson. And turns out Eliana's transgender. Next time I saw Oscar, I said, hey, Oscar, is Eliana in your class? And he went, yeah. I said, did you know Eliana's transgender? He went, yeah. So it turns out the parents went to the school, said Eliana wants to come to school dressed as her authentic self. And uh, the parents spoke to the administrators, the administrators spoke to the teachers, the teachers spoke to the children. And these were like five and six year olds and they didn't think anything of it. You know, they said, okay. So I, Haley, I think your comment that we need to educate the adults is right on. And I wanted to and, share a story that's even perhaps more basic than what you're speaking of, Mark. I have some friends here and um, there's a hodgepodge of expats and local Mexicans that could have sort of mixed together. And a lot of these expats have kids and they're going to school and it's a very sort of hippie community here. So we get some very interesting names. And amongst the adults, we're talking about this one boy who has a very interesting name and all the adults are like going, oh my God, where did the parents get this name from? And this little boy pops up and my friend asks him, do you know so-and-so? And the kid was like, yeah. And they're like, what do you think of his name? And they're like, I don't know, it's a name. And he carries on running off. To this little kid, he wasn't like, the name doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But it was all the adults sitting around like completely stewing and picking over, how could they name that? What does that mean? What's that going to mean for the rest of the life? And it's just like, come on, people. Like, yeah. what is it going to take for the adults to stop and say, okay, maybe and, this is enough? Well, yeah, and the, well, two things. Uh, if, if kids don't get sex education in school, uh, you know, with all these governors saying, no, you're not going to get it, they're going to get it on the internet. They know what they're doing, you know. Uh, educating adults, Haley, um, for me, it, it needs to happen in two, at least two places. One is in people's places of faith, mm. uh, because uh, the, the people take very seriously what's going on in their faith. And if they could have somebody in their faith explain human sexuality to them and have them trust that person, because they, they, they won't trust me, right? if I'm coming from a background that they find offensive or scary, but they would trust their pastor or their minister or of the, the wife of the minister. Uh, and the other way for me is through the arts. You know, one of the things I get so excited about when we watch movie after movie and TV series 
is that all of this information is becoming uh, 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 available. Uh, stuff that they're talking about things that would never be allowed when I was a kid. And so I think we're getting healthier, you know, in terms of our um, the general population's understanding of human sexuality, at least the basics. I personally believe, in, and I've said this last week, Haley, um, Mark, I believe that our generation, you know, Haley, you, me, um, all the baby boomers, gen, you know, Generation Z, um, our job in evolution is to take on these is, isms. You know, uh, uh, Tom Brokaw called uh, the World War II generation the greatest generation. Well, that was right for that generation. They had to fight the war. We're fighting our own war against the isms because human nature is never going to grow in evolution until we get rid of racism and sexism, right? Mm -hmm. Homophobia, get rid of the fears so that we can evolve more. And so I think a hundred generations from now, looking back, are gonna look at us and say, boy, you know, they did the heavy lifting on this one. And thank God they did it because we never would have gotten to where we are now if they hadn't done it. I think we're trending in the right direction. It's just, yeah. I think so, we have to have these blow ups so that everybody can sit back and say, what is this about? Mm -hmm. yes. And my hope is, my wish is that in asking the question, what is this about? They look internally. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I think a lot more people are looking internally. You know, I think that statistics on the people who are unchurched, you know, uh, have grown and grown and grown. But that doesn't mean the people aren't spiritual. It just means that they're no longer accepting dogma. You know, they're on their own. They're, they're searching inside themselves. Haley, you know, you know better than the three of us about the searches that people are making inside themselves to find themselves so that they can move forward. Am I right? I, I, you know, I think this is where I have the hope because that is where I work. Um, and I realize it's a bubble. <laughs> Um, I'm well aware that there is a lot of, if we just look at the media, we would think that the world is about to burn down every day. Um, but I think ultimately we have to see that there's intrinsically more good in this world. Because every morning we wake up and the sun is still shining. The birds are still singing. We're not waking up to an apocalypse every mm -hmm. morning. Of mm -hmm. course, there are apocalypse spots in the world, but that's not the entire world. So I think, you know, how much are we missing in not hearing the good stories? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think if we look back from when I was a kid to today with all these issues, it's gotten much better. But we still have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. And that's and such a rub too. You know, it's gotten much better when we look at the suffering that people go through today. Yeah it's still just as awful. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you think about how many people when I was in high school were openly gay, where you have it today, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a big difference. Yeah. And no one was openly gay in my high school. No one was openly gay in my high school. And so. I graduated in 1966. Uh, I graduated my... in 1966. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> that that's a funny thing. You know, uh, just funny story, if I can. Um, when we were moving out of Provincetown, I fell and tore my hand open. And it was filled with all kinds of debris. And, and uh, they sent me up to a hospital in Boston uh, to the emergency room. And the guy who was... Uh, in the emergency room happened to be a hand specialist, right? So he spent three hours on my hand. And so I said, where are you from? You know, I don't look at my hand. I'm looking away. He said, I said, where are you from? He said, oh, I'm from Michigan. I said, oh, I'm from Michigan. I said, uh, where'd you live? He said, Birmingham. I said, well, I lived in Birmingham. I said, I went to Brother Ice High School. He said, I went to Brother Ice High School. <laughs> I said, I was senior class president in 1966. He said, I was senior class president in 1996. 
<laughs> and all the magical. people, all the names that he, were his friends were the children of people I went to school with. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> Uh, we have about 15 minutes of this call left and I wanted to sort of see how we can help or any ideas that we have to sort of help soften the conversation and sort of encourage people to stop and listen before just shout. Mm -hmm. So in your experience, Mark, with all of your films, what do you believe is sort of your toolkit to encourage people to just stop and listen versus talk? Well, I think the films are tools that just watching a film isn't going to do it. And the film is used to open communication. And when I, when people are watching a film, I always say to them, if they're watching it with friends or family or a partner, I said, use the pause button. If something is going on in the film and you have something to say or have a question, pause it and speak and open the communication about that issue. And I think that is the important thing that we need to start talking openly and tell people how we feel. If we're uncomfortable, why are you uncomfortable? And maybe you can work through that when it comes to you know, if you were taught that people who are transgender are, you know, just not not normal, I think you you can learn from using films and from communicating. And I think we need to educate ourselves about these issues. And not everyone has the luxury of taking a class in school or university. And if you don't, in fact, many people self-educate and use films in that respect. How about for you, Brian? I, two, two things, Haley. One um, is not being afraid to talk about it, but talk about it in a way that doesn't scare people. One of the things that's happened at our house at the dinner table is that, and it's been going on for years, is that people know that we'll talk about human sexuality while we're having dinner, you know, some aspect of it, somebody. And so speaking up about your own, and if you personalize it, if you say, this is what my experience is, it's much easier than some abstract. But the second thing is listening. You know, when a person starts telling their story, be quiet up here, right? Don't be thinking of what you're going to say. Listen, take it all in, right? Be with them in the moment. Um, and when that happens, I think they will feel heard. And then you can come back and find out whether or not they might change their attitude on something, right? I heard you say this. The same thing happened to me. You know how I changed? I met this person who, and then you tell the story. What about you, Haley? What do you think makes it? I think listening is the number one. You know, it's mm -hmm. been sort of in my face that very, a lot of the perpetuated trauma that we see tends to be because there's no listening. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, something I've been sitting with is do you need to have a spiritual practice to learn how to listen? And every time I ask myself that question, I keep hearing, no, listening is a choice. Listening is, do you want to listen or do you not want to listen? Mm. So I think, you know, I hope it's, you know, more about the progress that we're seeing, whether it's fast or slow, also means that more and more people have personal experiences with different people. And I think if we can just take time to personalize that and ask the question, right, if this was your kid, what would you do? Mm -hmm. Yes. And yeah. hopefully that will open up some of the listening. Um, I don't think we're going to get away from this chaos and sort of the very fire nature to where we are. I think we very much need this. 
Um, and I do have hope that it is going to end up in something good. It's just frustrating that there's still a lot of nonsense and no listening. I think you have to give people a reason to listen. Mm -hmm. You know, it can't be a, a homework assignment. It can't be forced. It, it can't be forced. You, we, what I say, when we listen, we grow. You know, when we hear somebody else's story, we see more of the universe than we did before they told their story. Mm -hmm. So there's a benefit to listening. Right? You get something out of it. You feel better. Yes, you do. You feel better about yourself and the world. Yeah. What about you, Mark? Well, I think you have to let people know that you're willing to listen and that you are open to hear and you're comfortable and or you want them to be comfortable talking to you and you're willing to listen. And, you know, that can be done by teachers, by uh, parents, friends. You, you know who you can talk to and who is willing to listen and who is not going to pass judgment. And... It's an important part of this, being able to share your story and have someone listen to it. Mm -hmm. Someone you can trust. Yes. You know, I, I, I will say to an audience often, you know, um, parents will say to me, how come my son told his Aunt Martha that he was gay before he told me? Mm -hmm. And there was something about Aunt Martha that you knew that no matter what you said, you know, you are going to get embraced. Mm -hmm. And everybody and has an Aunt Martha. Everybody has an Aunt Martha. You know, we all are Aunt Marthas. You know, yeah. well, our friends know that they can say something to us without us judging them. Way back in the 70s, I was teaching in a high school. And a gay high school student came up to me and we were talking. And he said, I want to tell my father I'm gay. And I said, how do you think he'll react? He said, I don't know. So I said, why don't you test him? He said, what do you mean? He said, if you see something in the news or if you see something, say, hey, dad, what do you think of that? Well, he came back to me in a week later and he said, I'm not telling my father. <laughs> I said, why not? Do you remember Sergeant Matlovich? Mm -hmm. He was a friend of mine. Re oh, really? His cover, his picture was on the cover of Time magazine. And uh, he was an openly gay man in the army. And his and father they, had. His and they father, kicked him out. Yes. And his father had the Time magazine on the table. And he said, hey, dad, what do you think of this guy? And his father said, they should shoot the faggot. So he said, I did not tell my father I was gay. Yeah. But, 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 and, and, and as an aside, Lenny Matlovich said, they gave me a medal for killing a man and threw me out for loving one. Now, which is yeah. really powerful. Yeah. Um, dad mom and dad say awful things about it because they think it's a choice and they think that if they say the most horrible things about being gay or about being trans then you won't make the choice you're going to follow the straight and narrow but if the father father hears from the son he loves mark you know what he said about lenny matlovich was about an abstract thing but when the kid comes out and says dad I, you need to know you know that i'm gay and i've suffered my whole life with this i've even thought about taking my life you know you said 41 percent of trans my guess is equal number of gay kids you know myself included either tried or thought about suicide if the if the child tells the parent what their experiences have been because they haven't been able to tell the parent. My guess is that most people, most parents choose love over fear. Yeah. Well, in 1976 or seven, when this happened, I didn't have that 
in me. In other, yeah. I couldn't advise him that way. Yeah. So I've in the last I've learned a little more since then. But I that was a first. Yeah. That was a first experience for me. Uh huh. I do think that all of this stems from love. You know, I I would believe very strongly that parents move towards fear because they're so afraid of their kid experiencing such awfulness. Mm -hmm. So they do their best to not allow the child to go that way. And I think it either stems from love of the child or love of themselves because their love is also, you know, moves towards fear. And now they're afraid of how awful is my life going to be if everybody finds out I have a gay child. Mm -hmm. And I think if we could all just take a minute to listen and be like, so you're afraid because you love yourself or somebody so much, and you're afraid because you love yourself or somebody so much, can we just come back to love? Mm. Haley, to support what you just said, when I came out to my mom and dad, uh, mom got up and went into the kitchen where my older sister was, and she was crying and she said, the world is going to be awful to Brian and there's nothing I can do to protect him. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's heartbreaking. It's hard to understand. And I think it's hard to understand all the time. But I think a lot of the time, I think John Steinbeck has a line that we're all just trying to do our best. Mm -hmm. It may not look pretty, but ultimately we're all just trying to do our best based on what we know and what we've learned is the best way to move forward. I and agree. one can only hope that yeah. as we see this progression in our consciousness, that we start the best, the standard on the best is raised. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Every morning, Ray and I begin our meditation by saying, today I will work hard to be the person I aspire to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think. And, and, and it catches me, you know, during the day. Brian, is this the person you aspire to be? I, that is my motivation too. Is this the best? Are you doing your best right now? Can you do yeah. better? That's a great way to live. Yeah. And it's. If I, I honk the horn, am I doing my best? Yeah. And I'm very <laughs> aware I... of the impact too. And I know that, you know, we've all had our own spiritual journey. So we start being more conscious about what is my best and how does that impact the rest of the world? So, you know, ending this call, we can do it. <laughs> so many others can too. Yes, if, if they're offered the, um, the guidance, you know, if they just hear it, they think, wow, I like that. I'm going to try that. Yeah. I think, you know, for a bunch of people that really have no good reason to be having this conversation, the fact that we all have the intention to be better and to try and have a more powerful impact. If we can do it, you can do it. Yep. Absolutely. And, and if we fail, uh, we're going to get back up again and try again tomorrow. Back up. Tomorrow's a new yep. day. <laughs> Tomorrow's a new day and I'm going to be the best person I can aspire to be. Indeed. Indeed. We have a few minutes left, Mark. I wanted to see if you had any closing comments or anything else that you wanted to add. No, I, I think this was a wonderful experience. I, I am so glad I got to express this. And sh I just hope that listeners will take this in and look at the history, look at education, look at communication and help people to be themselves. Mm -hmm. I think that's a wonderful message. And that's a great way to end. <laughs> Thank you all. I hope you have a wonderful week. I thoroughly right. enjoyed today. I'm definitely going to go forward today with a different and a much wider perspective. Thank you, Haley. Thank, Thank you, Haley. Thank you, Brian. Lots of love. Bye. Bye-bye.